Hey everyone from Healthy Mindful Self followers. This is Lisa Nesneski, and I am here as part of our series on amazing practitioners. I am featuring this month, the month of March, Tom Walters from Zen Commuter. Hi, Tom. Hey, Lisa. Thank you for having me today. Great, great. It's my pleasure. You know, um, why don't you introduce yourself and then uh, we can talk about how we met. Fantastic. I am the host of Zen Commuter and Calmer in Five, two podcasts out on Apple Podcasts. I'm a meditation instructor. Uh, that's what I do and help people become more peaceful, more introspective, wiser. Well, the tagline for Zen Commuter is calmer, wiser, and happier. So if you if we tag all three of those, I think a life is, uh, that's a pretty full life if we can tag all three of those things. Calmer, yes. Wiser, double check and happier. <laughs> Love it. Uh, that, that's amazing. Uh, you know, we met through uh, a mutual podcast friend who uh, connected us. I did a podcast with you interview on seven mindful questions a few months ago. Uh, I'll put the episode number into the, the uh, notes about our interview. So we did that interview and, and I was incredibly uh, impressed with the level of information that you provide. Uh, what I find so interesting about Zen Commuter and your practice is that uh, you take abstract concepts and make them very relatable. Well, uh, thank you. Because much like we talked about pre-interview um, and many of the people listening today, um, I've been meditating for over 40 years? Have I hit the 40 year mark yet? Which is, I think I'm close. I think yeah, it's 38. 80, yeah, 82. 82. 40 years. So yeah, here we are, 40 years. <laughs> exactly. But as we were talking about, a meditation back then was very, um, nobody knew about it. Uh, not much was said about it at all. And now, obviously, mindfulness and meditation are all over the place. And again, much like we talked about uh, before we got on the air is that there's a lot of misinformation out there. And um, Sometimes people have the best um, intentions in, re in regards to meditation, but on some level, there might be a level of ego that comes in. So they, they want to try and impress people with all that they know. Uh, but in doing so, it scares a lot of people like, oh, my gosh, here's this, per this man or this woman that's been meditating for 40 years. And like, I don't know if I could ever do it like that. Or I don't know if they're there's an absolutely perfect way to do it. And as we know, there, um, if you're doing it, then you're doing it right. Uh, so it was very important for me to help people understand uh, the benefits of meditation in a very practical way, in a very uh, down to earth way, because my goal is to have as many people understand their power, their wisdom, uh, and who they are. And the only way they can do that, well, there are many ways to do that, but one of the most effective ways to do that is through meditation. Um, so I wouldn't want anybody to feel left out, whether they think I, I can't do this right. I'm like, I don't care if you're a CEO or somebody who's a student or somebody who's like in high school, whatever, anybody and everybody has the ability to meditate. And it was very important for me to find a way to make it approachable, uh, to take all these concepts that are, could be a little heady and make them uh, approachable, uh, make it approachable and kind of tiny bite-sized pieces so that people can all feel that they can get into a meditation practice, which will obviously benefit them in the long run. Well, I totally agree with you. You know, we're, we're both meditation teachers and I originally started in a completely different style than mindfulness meditation. So I have two different ways that I meditate on a regular basis. I do the mindfulness in the morning to set my, my day. And then I use the other style at night, which is more of an energy-based healing type meditation. And so between the two, I think I've got my bases covered, but I think uh, as I was learning mindfulness, I found that some of the Buddhist uh, concepts to be a bit beyond me. So um, I think that's one of the advantages that your uh, podcast provides is that you're very relatable in, in, especially with some of these more esoteric concepts. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. In regards to Buddhism specifically or meditation and Buddhism? Yeah, um, both. Well, uh, one of the good things that I have is a variety of resources, and I would encourage uh, listeners to avail themselves to 
uh, The Lion's Roar and uh, Tricycle, two publications that are Buddhist, uh, Buddhist based. Uh, and they do the exact same thing. Um, they take meditation and Buddhist concepts and really just take all that uh, ethereal kind of knowledge and really make it applicable to our day to day lives. Like, how do we approach Buddhism and meditation when we are in a meeting uh, at work and it's not going well and we want to pull out our hair? Uh, <laughs> how do we take all these concepts? <laughs> I, I was going to say, you're shaking your head. I definitely have been there and I know you have as well. <laughs> like, is this exactly. my life? How did this happen? <laughs> yeah, you know, the, the worst part of working from home now that you're on the camera, you cannot hide your face when, when you're like, Yes, this isn't going well, you know, so I, I do I tend to put my hands on my heart so I could, you know, just get back in touch with yes, this is upsetting. And I love you know. that. I love that. <laughs> so, um, you know, uh, mindfulness, secular mindfulness uh, doesn't necessarily need to use the un, I guess what I'm trying to say is that if you want to practice mindfulness, you don't necessarily need to know anything at all about Buddhism. Would you agree nope, with that all. statement? Absolutely, 100%. To be honest, I still don't know the answer if Buddhism is a religion or is it a philosophy? And I've asked many right. uh, Buddhist um, people that have come on uh, Zen Commuter to, to talk about that. But for me, it's coming across more as a philosophy. Uh, and for me, that is most helpful. And basically, one of the premises of Buddhism is no, there's no deity per se to tell you how to live your life. Uh, the Buddha himself said, this is how I did it. If it works for you, cool. Here's how I did it. Here's how I went inside to see, uh, to reach enlightenment. This is how I came about. But he doesn't say you have to do it that way. If you want to be enlightened, do it this way. Buddhism is all about, okay, here's a meditation. Here's a way meditation to go inside to find enlightenment for yourself. And it's gonna be different for every person. So I think for me, when it came to Buddhism, that lack of dogma was something that really uh, resonated with me. You know, Buddhism as a philosophy is uh, a concept that I resonate with because uh, I have a fairly strong Christian faith, but I, I layer the, the uh, mindfulness meditation on top because I've been a lifelong pursuer of uh, self-knowledge, understanding myself, understanding the way that I um, behave in certain situations. But what, what I've found is that for me personally, um, it, it was a shortcut. So um, I struggled with finding my voice. So, you know, I, I've written uh, the seven mindful questions. I had a, another book before that. So finding my voice that I could speak and write and really have something to say, um, because I was very unsophisticated in the way that I would deal with people verbally. And I recognized that and um, it was modeling from my youth. You know, you just sort of behave the way that you see other people behaving. So, um, I would rather be mute than hurt someone. Yeah, I so, love I'm, that. so now I'm finding that I have much uh, calmer, wiser, uh, circumspect ways to uh, handle situations when they happen. So the wise speech concept that I learned in mindfulness, it's a, it's a fruit of the spirit, if you will, you know? Yo, absolutely. And if I can uh, piggy, uh, piggyback on that, one of the things I talk about on Zen Commuter all the time is uh, one of the benefits of meditation is to have us create a gap uh, between stimulus and response. Sometimes uh, without a meditation practice, uh, we could literally, somebody could say something that would be upsetting to us and we won't even think about it. We'll just literally just take it as an attack and attack back. Um, and that, I think that's how many people exist um, in, our, in our culture, unfortunately. Uh, but with meditation, we have the ability to create kind of like a bubble between thought, uh, stimulus and response. So somebody can say something to us and instead of um, literally just lashing back, suppose it's something angry or hurtful that somebody says, we have uh, like a little space to say, huh, I don't know if that's an accurate statement. Maybe this is where this person is coming from. It's, I cannot, uh, I can look at it in such a way that, okay, I've got this bubble, I've got this time, 
I'm looking at this very objectively and I can create uh, a cogent response um, to that and not have to get drawn into the emotion, get totally swept into all that, uh, those denser energies. So it's just like, gives you that kind of place to just be like, hmm, let me look at that as opposed to (laughs) (laughs) articulately put. (laughs) No, I totally, totally agree with you that, um, you know, it's owning your own space, owning your own emotions and um, deciding how you want to uh, be in the world. Exactly. So one of the reasons that we're doing these uh, featured uh, practitioners is that um, I can really have, I really have a sense that you, Tom, have uh, love at your core. You love what you do. You're passionate for what you do, but you're also attempting to live your life uh, in that way. Uh, Indeed. And uh, I appreciate that because I always want to come across as uh, well, I just want to be recognized as love. Um, and one of the things I talk about on Zen Commuter all the time is we have um, a challenge when we get so um, myopic in just thinking about us uh, and our vision of the world stops right here. It's like, okay, whatever's going on in here, that's real. Whatever's out there, I don't care. People get so caught up in their challenges that they don't see the bigger picture. Um, and one of the things for me, that is so beneficial is to come from love in every situation. Uh, Whether I'm meeting one person, 20 people, a thousand people, I always want my interactions with people to be, uh, to end better. So if I meet somebody, I want them to leave thinking, wow, this world is beautiful. There's love everywhere. Uh, So I try and infuse love wherever I can. Um, And for me, it's, it is what I am. So it's pretty easy to do. <laughs> good, 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 good. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about your meditation practice itself? Sure. Uh, I, much like you, uh, I meditate twice a day, uh, one in the morning, once in the morning, uh, once in the evening, 20 minutes, uh, each time. And for me, I think we talked about this, I meditate in the morning first thing because it just sets up the day just so wonderfully Uh, instead of like waking up, hitting snooze, hitting snooze, hitting snooze. And like, you're looking like, I got to get out of this house or I'm going to be late for work. That's like no life that I would ever wish for anybody. (laughs) So uh, for me, my meditation practice has me sitting and that stillness, that um, introspective time when I get done off the cushion, I'm like, "Hmm, it's going to be a beautiful day regardless of whether it goes the way I want it to or not, it's going to be a beautiful day. So that's how I start off my meditation practice. And it varies um, for listeners. Um, Sometimes I'll use the timer and I'll just be in silence and I'll just um, um, break it down. Well, actually, I can go a little deeper because uh, when I use the timer, I, my 20 minute sessions are broken into five minute segments and it sounds wildly retentive, <laughs> but bear with me. So the, the first five minutes, I'm just, uh, for one better word, bring myself down to level. And that's my way of saying I'm entering that meditative space. Um, and then the second five minute interval, I'm um, seeing uh, the bigger picture, how I want my life to uh, play out, how I can best serve the world and myself um, and that five minute time. Um, and then the, uh, the next five minute segment is, um, working on some goals that I have, some visualizing goals that I have in my mind, um, well, personal goals and, and professional goals, you know, for Zen commuter and Commerce five. And then the last five minute segment is just that day. I, I choose three words that, um, capture how I want to feel. So whether it be like, focused, loving, calm. And I pick three words each day. And then in my mind's eye, I picture myself uh, exhibiting those three words throughout the entire day with, with regard, you know, regardless of what comes up, whether it be uh, I get caught off, uh, caught off in traffic or have a difficult uh, conversation with somebody. And like, in my mind, this is where I'm coming from. And when we have that intention, um, that uh, just that awareness of those energies kind of put them out into the world. So uh, that's how I focus and create intention for the day. Uh, So that's my meditation practice with the timer. And then there are many times when I go out on insight timer, when I just do a guided meditation with some amazing, amazing uh, instructors out on insight timer. 
Let me circle back to your your uh, your intervals. I do <laughs> find that the first five minutes of my meditation, I do need to bring myself uh, to the meditation, if you will. Mm -hmm. So uh, letting go of the day or future day, you know, just being in the moment, you know, relaxing. Right. Um, I kind of break the rules because I like to sip coffee in the first five minutes because I find coffee is very grounding. But nice. yes, I agree with you. It takes about five minutes for yourself to settle down when you're a longer time practitioner and you have a life outside of meditation. <laughs> right. So, <laughs> um, I like the idea of visualization. I do something similar, but uh, it's actually before I get out of bed. So I will actually set my intentions for the day uh, while I'm in bed with my three uh, words for what I'd like the word uh, uh, day to be. So I start off even before I'm out of bed. And then, then um, when I use the insight timer, I do have the five minute bells. I love the five minute bells. It's so easy Seriously. to set them up that way. Um, I find that um, there are times that 15 minutes goes by and I'm like, that was like five minutes, you know? <laughs> so I find that time compresses. Yep. And there are other times when I'm maybe physically not well, when I do a much shorter meditation because my right. body requires that. So I guess my point is to be flexible, have options. You mentioned insight timer is wonderful. Uh, you have a standard process, if you will, and you riff on that, you'll, you know, whatever you feel you need to do. And I think that's an important message for especially the beginner meditators, mm -hmm. is that uh, there, there is no set way. And if you go expecting an experience, you'll have that experience. I agree wholeheartedly, because many times, um, much like I was talking about earlier, that we're so bombarded with meditation, um, um, different meditation styles, and just meditations everywhere. So Many people go on in uh, Twitter or Insight Timers. Hey, I just meditated for an hour. I just meditated for two hours. And people that are starting out will be like, what? Meditate for two hours? Like, I could never do that. I'm like, yeah, exactly. Hey, well, you don't have to. So to your point, yeah. five minutes, 10 minutes. Um, and they're just like you. Most most times my meditations are 20 minutes. But same thing. If I'm just like, uh, I'm, my, if my mind is, if I'm in, a, if I'm meditating and I'm even having trouble um, uh, focusing, you know, if, if, if I'm, you know, thought, breath, thought, breath, thought, breath, that's happening a lot. I'm like, okay, you know what? I'm not going to push this. This isn't, I'm, I'm here now and that's cool. I'm going to end this. I'll come back to it. So uh, it's important for beginners to know that uh, A, your meditation practice isn't going to be the same every day. Some days it'll be flawless and easy and uh, producing wisdom. And other times you'll be like, ah, okay, focus, ah, focus. It's like, it's going to be up and up, up and down. That's why it's a practice. But the overarching point is five minutes, 10 minutes, an hour, whatever works for you. And to be able to have that flexibility and not just like we're talking about um, overall is you don't need to look anywhere out for, outside for validation. Your practice is your practice. And uh, you don't need to praise anybody, uh, your instructor, uh, the world. Like it's for you, solely for you. And it's not selfish to have a meditation practice that is just for you because when we have a meditation practice, when we are calm and centered and loving, that, that, that you time translates into world time, meaning that you are a better person for the world. You are kinder, more loving. So if you need to spend five minutes, 20 minutes, an hour, do whatever you do, because that light and that love is going to make its way out into the world because of what you do. That was really profound. Thank you. I appreciate that, you know, getting getting that message out into the world. So um, I think we have in common an audience that are working professionals. And so um, I think that's one of the reasons you started the Zen Commuter. So um, what are some advice that you would give to working professionals? Well, any the good thing about a meditation practice is it transcends um, categorizations or delineations. So whether you are uh, a CEO, whether you are uh, an end user, a student, like the benefits of meditation are boundless. Um, many times people come to me uh, from the business world, say, I hear that meditation can increase my focus. I'm like, absolutely it can. It's the very nature of what meditation is. Um, can it make me more creative? I'm like, yep. Make me more attentive. I'm like, yep. 
So many times people come to me for those very pragmatic uh, reasons. I mean, like, you know what? I want to not stress throughout the day and I want to be able to create ideas and thoughts instead of uh, having a head that's just like, I got to do this, got to do that. So many people come to me with that goal. Um, but one of the things I love, the transitions or the transformations that I love is, and I know it happens every time. Well, it doesn't happen every time, but nine times out of 10, people come to me with a very rational, pragmatic reason to meditate. And because they've never experienced silence or stillness before, uh, it morphs into something much more profound. So yes, they are becoming more focused. Yes, they're becoming more creative. Yes, they're becoming more attentive. And then because they've introduced themselves to this space of quiet and stillness. They're like, I'm not just reacting. I'm like, so what else is this world? I'm like, yeah, absolutely. That's the coolest thing ever to have that silence, to not just be responding to news or people. It's like you have a space to explore you, the human you, the soul that is you, the divinity that is you. And it, it just, makes me happier than happy when people come to me to learn about meditation, be creative, focused, uh, and um, attentive, and then leave thinking like, I just had this experience where I felt connection with all life. I'm like, <laughs> that's so awesome. <laughs> so those transformations are what I like. But getting back to your initial question, um, just having a practice is going to be beneficial wherever you are. Um, and as um, you've talked about uh, business people or anybody in the workforce um, comes up uh, against a lot of um, stress and a lot of uh, tension. So meditation practice is going to have you, much like we said earlier in our pre-interview, looking at things like, this isn't the end of the world. I'm like, you know what? There's a big, big world. There's a big, big, when we step back and see the whole picture, I'm like, yes, this is important right now, but it's not going to be the definitive moment for my life or for this company. Or So knowing that uh, you have that place of stillness, whether you're going into a very busy meeting, a very busy presentation, you can take that piece with you. And that's one of the goals of meditation is much like we talked about earlier, taking um, your peace and serenity from your cushion and interspersing it throughout your day. So the, those two become very melded. I'm, back in the day when I first started meditating, I was like, meditation, cool. 20 minutes and then I go back to life. <laughs> it was kind of like a, well, a stopgap. That, that is absolutely true. The way that most people start is that it's, it, it's a considered, you know, I brushed my teeth and now I'm going to go on and have my day. You know, I've meditated. I'm going to go on and have my day. Right. Um, what I'm finding is that as you still are doing things, you, you still have a to-do list. You still are a human doing things. <laughs> right. But, the human that's doing those things has a much more in-depth level of calmness and introspection in the way that you're doing things. And so um, those who are in the workforce, bringing yourself in that way, the best of you to your job is, is invaluable. You know, you want people Absolutely. who are going to be high performers, but you know, you don't want them to burn themselves out. So, so looking at uh, meditation as a tool to recenter and rebalance life, I think is really important. So thanks for, our, for that information. I do have a few more questions. I've got oh, them right down here. Um, how do people get in touch with you? So there are two ways. They can either uh, head on over to zencommuter.com and they can listen to the podcast there. They, there are a couple uh, blog articles there. Um, but one of the things I'm very happy to say is I am very approachable. So, uh, I do not have a team of 20 people, uh, that are answering emails. So, uh, I love it when people email me T H O M at zencommuter.com is the easiest way to get in touch with me. And I love opening up dialogues about meditation, Buddhism, calmer living. Uh, so definitely you can reach out to me via email and I answer all those uh, myself because, uh, well, it just, creating that dialogue between people is what it's kind of one of the, the labors of love that I have for Zen commuter and the podcast is just uh, I've been able to meet so many wonderful people like yourself, other guests and uh, my listeners as well. And when I create relationships with them and uh, help them see themselves in a wonderful way, then that makes me happy. So definitely T H O M at Zen or head on out to the website, Zen 
And I can attest that you definitely answer your emails and quickly. So it's <laughs> thank you. Um, okay, so we've got the website. T tell us about your newsletter. So yeah, uh, each week I put out a newsletter that either tells people uh, a tip on how to meditate, uh, but it also um, one of the things I know, and I'm sure you're the same way, is I teach meditation, but I'm not the be all end all. Uh, there are so many people that I know that are doing amazing things, wonderful things. Uh, so I'll, I share resources uh, of other people, uh, whether it be, and sometimes I'll read articles from um, from Tricycle or the Lion's Roar. So that's a great way to get in touch with me, but also to foster your uh, your own growth and your own meditation practice. So there, it comes out uh, weekly and people can just head on to Zen Commuter and uh, sign up for that as well. So thank you. You're welcome. And you not only do you have the Zen Commuter podcast, you are an overachiever and have two podcasts. <laughs> I do. <laughs> and I, I do. asked you, why do you have two podcasts? So tell the audience. Yeah. So uh, real briefly, the, the Zen Commuter history was um, I was working for Fidelity for uh, about 11 years. And then I eventually had in a meditation uh, or a meditative moment, I said, I think I'm done. I think it's time for me to really do what I'm supposed to do. Uh, so I, uh, uh, and you know the story, I, I put a letter of resignation under my uh, boss's door on a Sunday when I was working uh, overtime just to get things squared away. Uh, but in that time, um, I'm like, okay, I still need to have some money coming in. So I was, uh, I was working for a company. Well, I, I actually got, uh, I did a temp job. I was working for a temp agency. Uh, but I'd never had a commute before. Fidelity was literally up the street. And then when I became a personal trainer, the gym was right down the street. But this was the first time I had ever had a commute. And uh, I got onto the highway and the, er, stopped. And I'm like, why are we stopped? What is this? Is, do people do this? Literally just sit on the pavement? This, this stinks. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I found myself getting a little, I'm like, ah, this stinks. I'm like, if I'm having trouble with this and I'm a pretty chill guy, then I'm thinking a lot of people are having trouble with this. So that's, that's the, that's the, the reader's digest version of how Zen commuter came to be to help people get to work in a much more, uh, relaxed space. But much like we talked about, uh, you don't just go to work and stay there. You come home too. So you need something to relax, uh, and come back on the same way, uh, coming home. So that's how, um, Comer and five was, um, was created for the, the trip back, so to speak. Uh, and now I don't even have a commute, but I still keep those things going. So we still have a, a morning show and an evening show. So people can uh, tap into that sense of calm, uh, hopefully. That's excellent. So the calm, calmer in five, if someone would listen to that, it's really, you're giving five minutes. Is that yep, right? Exactly. Uh, as you might expect, sometimes I go a little over. <laughs> See, that's I might be, believe. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, no way, you shy, quiet, you. <laughs> no, so we'll go over uh, and uh, ten minutes. Usually, I, th I think the longest one was ten minutes. So, and I tell people, I'm like, uh, just so you know, it's gonna be calmer and ten today. We got a lot to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it takes an extra five minutes. So, yep, absolutely. Right. So, um. I'm going to wrap this up with what makes your heart sing? Uh, I love that question uh, because anybody who meditates, hopefully, I shouldn't say anybody put that expectation, but when we meditate, we truly get in touch with what has meaning for us. Um, for me, um, I see and I feel, and I don't know if you do as well, I would imagine you would as an energy healer and just as a very uh, intuitive person, that there's so many people that doubt who they are. Uh, and our, as we said, our culture really denigrates people. Uh, if you're not a celebrity, then you're a second class citizen. If you're not this, if you're not making this much money, you're, uh, you're falling behind. And all those misperceptions, all those misbeliefs, all that inner dialogue is so, I, I don't want to use, well, I'm going to use the word, it's toxic and it, it just yeah. doesn't really serve us. Mm -hmm. um, so, what makes my heart sing is helping people understand that with a meditation practice, when they go inside, when they're quiet, when they can shut out all the noise of people telling them what they should be or how they should be, they find out what the real truth is, um, that on a, on a soul level, we understand our divinity. We know that we are light and love, and we don't need to be anything. We exist in light and love, and no job is going to give you validation the validation comes from going within. So 
what makes my heart sing is helping people understand and have that epiphany that when they meditate, they're like, I'm okay, just the way I am. I don't get to get, <laughs> I'm going to get choked up a little. I apologize. Sure. <laughs> we, we are, when we go inside, we, we do touch that divinity and, uh, to, it, you know, we, we sense the love that is our primary essence that our, uh, our soul is made of love. And as it, right. you know, it enters this physical being in our body, of course, you know, that we, we get into these denser energies of a, you know, we got heavy bodies and, but if we can stay in touch with that love that's inside, we are okay. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So what makes my heart sing is helping people understand that they are absolutely beautiful and radiant and love and uh, whatever I can do to help people understand that I'll do. Excellent. Excellent. So I do want to tell everyone that Tom did uh, the, the art over his shoulder. Uh, I'm a fan, <laughs> quite a fan of that piece of art. We we're discussing techniques on how to do that. Um, so, you know, our creativity comes out in so many ways. I like to write. Nice. Tom likes to paint. But meditation will enhance whatever it is that you're, you want to be creative with. So I'm going to leave it at that. Would you like to have a last word? I think I would just kind of piggyback on what I said is just find a time to be silent and still. And when, when you're starting meditation, I'll be honest with you, depending on who you are, it could be tough because many times people run away from their thoughts. Uh, they don't want to be still because they've got that inner dialogue. And uh, real quickly, there are two different dialogues in our body. Uh, there's our inner dialogue, which is all the negative BS that we've uh, accumulated and heard from like, you're not like your sister, you're not as good as so-and-so. And you're like, and you just keep playing that over and over. But there's also a voice in you, much like we talked about, that's divine, that says, you're beautiful. And it's, it's quieter. And when we meditate, we have the ability to turn down that inner dialogue that says you're not enough and uh, increase the volume of your inner self, uh, your higher self that says, oh, no, you're, you're perfect. You're, you've got this, your love. Um, so meditation is helpful in those regards. So, uh, if you have any challenges with understanding the truth about who you are, uh, whether that be your physical self or your soul self or your higher self, meditation is going to be the best, uh, one of the best ways to, um, find that and do that research, that research <laughs> into who you really are. And it's an amazing journey. And I, uh, offer my assistance to anybody and everybody. Um, so by all means, um, they've got a wonderful resource in you. They've got a wonderful resource in me. So avail yourself to, um, to that and we'll get you, uh, understanding all the power that you are. And that's, uh, I think that's the most important thing to help people understand. I'm like, you are amazing. Don't let anybody ever tell you any differently. And when you turn your, uh, your source and when you turn into the source, that's internal, you'll fig figure that out. So. Absolutely. One of my favorite quotes from the Dalai Lama is prayer is when you talk to God, meditation is when God answers. I love that. I, I don't think I've ever heard that. That's awesome. Yeah, yep. that's Absolutely. one of my favorites. So um, check out the website, zencommuter.com. Email Tom at zencommuter.com. Sign up for the newsletter, listen to the podcast, avail yourself of the opportunity and uh, you'll find that Tom is just a wealth of, of information. So thank you so much for, for uh, being a highlighted special practitioner of the month. And I really appreciate you coming and, and having this conversation today. Well, Lisa, as, as it was the first time we met, uh, I am equally excited to talk uh, with you today, with uh, your, your audience today. And I am so excited that you're doing such amazing work and I'm glad that we are friends. <laughs> Me too. Me too. All right. Take care. Bye now. Take care, Lisa. Bye-bye. <laughs>